Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. I appreciate you joining us for the, our review of the United States Department of Education, the Information Security Review. And at this time, I'd like to yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Chairman Chaffetz. Uh, today's hearing is an opportunity, an opportunity to start managing the cybersecurity vulnerabilities and risk that this nation faces every day. I said it during the July hearing this committee held on the data breach at the Office of Personnel Management. It is an undeniable fact that America is under constant attack. I'm not talking today about bombs dropping or missiles launching, but the constant stream of cyber weapons aimed at our data. The good news for this hearing, we are not talking about a data breach today. But Dr. Harris, I want my message to be heard loud and clear. You do not want to be before this committee explaining to the American people how you left the PII of the sons and daughters of millions of Americans vulnerable to hackers. And it's important to realize that this is not a problem without solutions. The GAO and the Inspector General have made recommendations, not to mention the standards policy and programs of OMB, DHS, and NIST. What I'm trying to tell you is that this is not an issue of technology. This is an issue of management and leadership. Dr. Harris, you're on the spot today, but don't think you are being singled out. I've put, and we have put, federal CIOs and agency heads on notice time and again. Whether it be on FATARA implementation, data privacy, encryption, or compliance with federal information security policies and practices, this committee will be watching. We are talking to the inspector generals and reading their recommendations. Federal CIOs and agencies' heads need to be implementing the recommendations of the IGs and GAO, or be able to explain to me and this committee why they didn't. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and I want to just kind of, let's, let's stick to the facts here and go through some key numbers and metrics, because the, uh, the, the liability, the vulnerability is enormous. Uh, roughly the, uh, 17 years ago, uh, the liability to the taxpayers uh, in this category, we're talking about the Department of, in, uh, of Education, outstanding student loans, 17 years ago was roughly $150 billion. Today, taxpayers are liable for roughly $1.18 trillion, making the Department of Education essentially the size of Citibank. Most people don't realize how large and enormous uh, of a financial institution the Department of Education is. Um, there are roughly 40 million borrowers utilizing the Department of Education as essentially their bank and financial institution. This is a uh, organization, the Department of Education, that spends some $683 million, it will spend $683 million this year on information technology. But as we put up this slide, doing a self-assessment, if we can do this, the FATARA self-assessment, this is also an organization based on their self-assessment gets an overall F grade as it relates to IT. So we can look at data center consolidation, IT portfolio review savings, incremental development, and risk assessment transparency, earning it an F. You can take down that slide now. Um, this is a system that are not necessarily all the systems are utilizing encryption. This is a department where, put up the second slide, OMB is engaged in this cyber sprint. It is one of, I believe, only four agencies in all of federal government where they scored a negative 14 percent, negative 14 percent. You can put down that slide. We can provide that information. It's very hard to read in that group. But one of four uh, institutions where it actually scored negative on things or assessment of, say, dual uh, authentication. In fact, the Inspector General went in and looked at the Department of Education's IT operations, and the report finds, quote, the department-wide information systems continue to be vulnerable to security threats, end quote. The Inspector General made 16 findings, six of which are repeat findings. The in Inspector General made a total of 26 recommendation, recommendations, 10 of which are repeat recommendations. So how big is the vulnerability? We talked about it in terms of dollars. Americans need to know that the, the uh, Department of Education holds roughly 139 million Social Security numbers. 
in the central processing system. But let's also remember that 139 million Social Security numbers isn't necessarily all of them, because it does not include all the systems. That's just the central processing system. It does not include information for parents who submitted information but it's whose children did not get aid. Remember, if somebody, your child applies for aid, you're going to have your, perhaps your mother's information, perhaps your father's information there as well. That is also in the system and potentially very vulnerable. The central processing system processes federal aid applications at a year. We, we've been talking a lot about the vulnerability of the Office of Personnel Management, OPM, understanding the vulnerability, where we believe it's 22 million. The vulnerability at the Department of Education, we're talking about a trillion dollars, but we're also talking about over 130 million Americans. The department has 184 information systems, 184. This is just the Department of Education. 120 are run by contractors, 29 are valued by OMB as high assets. But one of the concerns that we have here is that the Inspector General also looked at what's called the COD, the Common Origination and Disbursement System. It's deemed as a major system. It is what is actually the system used to disperse uh, federal student aid to students and borrowers. This year alone, there was roughly $109 billion in direct loans and $31 billion in PELs dispersed through the COD. One of the fundamental problems that we've had here is access to that information and allowing the Inspector General to be able to go in and peek at the system, test and verify it. But this is also a problem. Another key system is the National Student Loan Database, which houses significant borrower information. The N it's called the NSLDS, the National Student Loan Database, has 97,000 accounts. This is the people that have access to student loans. These are the schools, the contractors. That's a lot of people being able to tap in and and have access to this system. But it's our understanding only 5,000 of the 97,000 have actually gone, undergone a background check, which again begs the question about allowing, allowing access to information that could be potentially vulnerable. It begs a lot of questions about safety, security, and integrity of the system. We're also going to hear, and uh, we have uh, hearings today on the Department of Education, but we also have hearings tomorrow on the Department of Education. And part of what we're going to hear tomorrow is that Department of Education was potentially responsible for roughly $4 billion in improper payments. $4 billion. So when we go home, we talk to our constituents about roads, bridges, infrastructure, about getting more money in the classroom. Utah has the lowest, lowest in the nation. We're not proud of it. Lowest, st lowest spending per pupil in the nation. And yet the Department of Education sends out $4 billion in improper payments. You know what a difference that would make in my classroom? Where we got kids with way too many kids in the classroom? I'm just telling you, it, it, it has become a monster, an absolute monster. We don't know who's in there. We don't know what they're doing. We know they're improper payments, and the Inspector General, the person we trust the most to go in there and take a look at, can't even have access because there's so many contractors who say, no, we're not going to let you look in there. No, you can't see it, and that's a problem. That's a problem that's got to change. So I've gone well past my time. There's lots to talk about over the next two days. This is going to be a good, healthy hearing. I appreciate members' uh, participation. Uh, there are a lot of competing hearings. You're going to see members coming and, coming and going as uh, as uh, the second day back, uh, 10 a.m., there's, there's a lot of hearings going on, but uh, this should be a good hearing. And uh, I now recognize uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Conley, for his. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panelists for being with us today. I appreciate the opportunity to examine the information technology and security programs and practices within the Department of Education and its federal student aid program. This department might not seem like an obvious target of cyber-related threats, but it is responsible for managing and securing student loan portfolios of more than $1 trillion, as you indicated, Mr. Chairman. 
along with the personal information of more than 50 million students between Federal loan borrowers, Pell Grant recipients, and other assistance programs. And as you indicated, Mr. Chairman, that may be the tip of the iceberg when one looks at over 130 million Social Security numbers uh, available to the Department. In the wake of two massive data breaches disclosed by the Office of Personnel Management earlier this year, which collectively put at risk the personal information of more than 28 million current and former Federal employees and their families, including members of Congress, like myself. Every Federal agency ought to be reassessing its own information security protocols and reinforcing efforts to detect and deter cyber attacks and other threats. Perhaps this should be the first of a recurring set of hearings to gauge successes and shortfalls across agencies when it comes to protecting the vast amount of sensitive information held by the Federal Government. I know Mr. Hurd uh, and Mr. Meadows uh, and, and yourself, Mr. Chairman, intend to do that, certainly with the implementation of FATARA, but maybe we need to do it with cybersecurity as well. I think we would find most agencies in a similar situation to this Department, which has made some progress in fortifying its information security defenses in recent years, but continues to struggle with recurring vulnerabilities. In its latest report in the Department's efforts to implement the Federal Information Security Modernization Act, FISMA, the Inspector General identified 16 findings with 26 recommendations, one-third of which are repeat recommendations, Dr. Harris. Last year's audit found that the Department did not perform adequate remediation of weaknesses identified in previous OIG re audit reports. That is very troubling in light of the OPM breach. While it appears the Department has beefed up its remediation efforts, there is still obviously much work to be done. And I am confident, unfortunately, this is not the only Department with these kinds of problems. This year's audit flagged weaknesses across four key areas, continuous monitoring, configuration management, incident response and reporting, and remote access management. For example, the IG found user accounts from inside Federal employees and outside Federal contractors with excessive or unnecessary permissions and unauthorized access to data. In fact, one of the Department's IT service contractors could not verify to the IG's satisfaction that its other non-Federal customers did not have unauthorized access to the Department's data through a shared service. Very troubling. Even more troubling, the OIG said it was able not only to gain access to the Department's network through a simulated attack, but also it was able to launch other attacks on systems connected to the Department while going completely undetected. Another critical finding in the IG's report that applies to the Department of Education as well as other Federal agencies is that existing information security protocols, if implemented and implemented consistently throughout the organization, could and should be effective. That is the good news. Nowhere is this more important than in cybersecurity and privacy training for new employees. To be successful here, we must bring about a wholesale cultural revolution so that Federal agencies in the workforce understand the critical importance of cyber safety, including basic elements of what may be called cyber hygiene. Along those same lines, we must hold the agencies accountable for implementation of the bipartisan FATARA legislation, on which we recently held a hearing and issued a preliminary scorecard for agency progress. The Chairman has already noted that scorecard for this Department. One of the key reforms of that legislation, which I was pleased to co-write with the former Chairman of this Committee, is enhancing CIO authorities to increase transparency and improve risk management to address all of these issues. Unfortunately, the Department of Education received an F rating on this preliminary assessment based in large part on its self-reporting of few IT investments delivering functionality and their ability to produce savings. That is a snapshot in time, and we are hoping that it is a work in progress and that uh, the next snapshot will show that progress. I look forward to hearing from Mr. Harris about the steps he is taking to address both FISMA and FATARA challenges. The severity of recent data breaches in both public and private sectors in recent years underscores the urgency for Federal agencies in Congress to get serious about investing in IT solutions that better secure our data and taking actions that will be clear deterrents for ha would be hackers. 
This is a challenge that has confounded both Democratic and Republican administrations. The number of IT security incidents reported by Federal agencies increased by 1,121 percent uh, from uh, the reporting period uh, in the last several years. Unfortunately, these attacks on our private industries and government simply reflect the new normal of the 21st century, where nation states represent advanced and persistent threats against one another, constantly seeking to gain unauthorized access to sensitive and classified information on each other's people, intellectual property, and sensitive security information. The likes of North Korea, China, Russia, and Iran are increasingly testing the waters and becoming emboldened by the lack of reprisal or effective deterrence. The House earlier this year did pass two bills on a bipartisan basis to encourage voluntary sharing of information between the public and private sectors. But information sharing is not enough. We need to get serious about strengthening our cyber workforce, both within the Federal Government and among our private sector partners. We also need to devise more effective data breach notification policies so that victims are aware of the fact they may have been compromised. As my colleagues know, it has now been almost four months since the breach back on background records uh, was announced and notifications are still being made. So, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate this opportunity to look at what the Department of Education is doing right and what it can improve upon with respect to securing data. But obviously, this can't be the only hearing. Successfully detecting, defending, and deterring cyber threats will take a concerted effort across all agencies and among our private partners. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, because this hearing clearly sends a signal this committee will take that charge seriously. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We will hold the record open for five legislative days for any members who would like to submit a written statement. And it is now uh, my pleasure to uh, recognize our witnesses. We are pleased to welcome Mr. Greg Wilshusen, uh, who is currently serves as the Director of Information Security Issues at the Government Accountability Office, where he leads a cybersecurity and privacy-related privacy studies and audits of the Federal Government and critical infrastructure. We also are joined by uh, Ms. Kathleen Tai, who serves as the Inspector General of the United States Department of Education. Ms. Tai also chairs the Council of Inspectors General on Integrity, Integrity and Efficiency and in 2011 was appointed by President Obama, uh, appoint, appointed by President Obama to the Recovery, Accountability and Transportation, uh, Transparency Board and the Government Accountability and Transparency Board. And we also are joined by Dr. Danny Harris, who currently serves as the Chief Information Officer at the United States Department of Education. Prior to his tenure as CIO, Dr. Harris served as the Chief Financial Officer at the Department of Education, where he started his career as a computer analyst. We welcome you all. Pursuant to committee rules, witnesses are to be sworn before they testify. So if you will please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Please be seated and let the record reflect that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. We would like some time and to be set aside for some robust discussion, so we would appreciate it if you would limit your testimony to five minutes. And Obviously, your entire written statement will be made part of the record. We will start with Mr. Will Shusen. He is now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Chaffetz, of Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing on information security at the Department of Education. As requested, my statement will address information security at Federal agencies, including education. Before I begin, if I may, I would like to recognize several members of my team who were instrumental in developing my statement and performing the work underpinning it. Larry Crossland, an assistant director, and Rosanna Guerrero led this body of work. Lee McCracken and Christopher Bozinski also made significant contributions. Mr. Chairman, for 18 years, GAO has designated Federal information security to be a government-wide high-risk area. In February, we expanded this area to include protecting the privacy of personally identifiable information. Recent security incidents, such as the OPM data breaches, underscore the vulnerability of Federal systems and highlight the evolving and sophisticated nature of the cyber threats that confront Federal security personnel on a daily basis. Over the last several years, Federal agencies have reported a sharp increase in the number of information security incidents, 
which have risen from about 5,500 in fiscal year 2006 to over 67,000 in fiscal year 2014, an increase of approximately 1,100 percent. Similarly, the number of incidents involving personally identifiable information has more than doubled since fiscal year 2009 to over 27,000 in fiscal year 2014. Given the risks posed by cyber threats and the increasing number of incidents, it is crucial that Federal agencies take appropriate steps to secure their systems and information. However, we and agency inspectors general have continued to identify significant deficiencies in controls protecting Federal information systems. For example, 19 of the 24 agencies covered by the Chief Financial Officers Act reported a significant deficiency or material weakness in information security for financial reporting purposes in fiscal year 2014. For its part, the Department of Education reported a significant deficiency, which is less severe than a material weakness, but important enough to merit attention by those charged with governance. As we previously reported for fiscal year 2014, Nearly each of the 24 agencies, including education, reported weaknesses in most of the five general control categories that we track. Like 21 other agencies, education had weaknesses reported in controls that are intended to prevent, limit, and detect unauthorized or inappropriate access to computer networks and sensitive information. Similar to most agencies, education also had weaknesses reported in its configuration management of its computing system, uh, continuity of operation controls, and management of its information security program. On the plus side, unlike 15 other agencies, education did not have weaknesses reported in its controls to segregate incompatible duties to among different individuals. For deficiencies in security controls and the efforts required to mitigate them, inspectors general at 23 of the 24 agencies, including education, declared information security as a major management challenge for their agency in fiscal year 2014. Over the past six years, GAO has made about 2,000 recommendations aimed at improving their information security programs and controls. To date, agencies have implemented about 58 percent of them. Recent actions in initiated by the Federal Chief Information Officer, such as the 30-day cybersecurity sprint and issuance of a cybersecurity strategy and implementation plan, indicate a new level of attention by OMB to the security of Federal networks, systems, and data at civilian agencies. Effective and timely implementation of this strategy and the rest of GAO's recommendations as well as those made by agency IGs will bolster agencies' abilities to protect their information systems and information. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Connolly, members of the committee, this concludes my opening statement. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Ms. Tai, you're now recognized for five minutes. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me here today to discuss the work of the U.S. Department of Education, Office of Inspector General, involving information security and technology security. The explosion of IT has revolutionized the way the world does business, and the department is no exception. Virtually every department program relies heavily on information systems. Evaluating whether those information systems are secure is a top priority for my office. As noted, the department reports 184 information systems in its inventory, more than 120 of which are operated by contractors or subcontractors some of which contain sensitive financial information and PII pertaining to millions of students, their parents, and others. These systems are accessed by thousands of authorized individuals, including department employees, contractor employees, and other third parties such as college financial aid administrators. Protecting its complex IT infrastructure from constantly changing cyber threats, responsibility and challenge for the department and its Office of Federal Student Aid. We examine the Department and FSA's information security controls every year through our FISMA audit and in the annual audits of the Department and FSA's financial statements. We also have conducted other IT security related work. As detailed in our written testimony, impact the security of information within the Department and contractor systems. For example, since 2009, including this year, audits of the Department and FSA's financial statements 
found persistent IT control deficiencies in key financial systems, including personnel security, access controls, and others. Since 2011, our FISMA audits have identified weaknesses in security control areas, including a number of repeat findings. Although our 2015 FISMA audit found that the Department has made progress and has taken steps to address repeat findings, our work determined that more is needed. This year's FISMA audit had two new features. First, the OIGs were required to evaluate the effectiveness of their agency security program in the 10 designated FISMA areas for the first time, F effectiveness meaning the extent to which security controls are implemented correctly, operate as intended, and produce the desired outcome. Second, the Council of the Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency, in coordination with OMB and others, rolled out the first phase of its new FISMA evaluation metrics called the maturity model, which summarizes the status of information security programs and their maturity on a five-level scale, with five being the best. The first phase encompasses the FISMA security area of continuous monitoring management. Our 2015 FISMA audit uh, found the department was at level one for continuous monitoring management and was not generally effective in three additional areas, configuration management, incident response and reporting, and remote access management. Notably, our penetration testing this year revealed a key weakness regarding the department's ability to detect unauthorized activity inside its computer networks. We determined that three areas were in fact generally effective risk management, security training, and contingency planning, although some improvements were needed. Finally, we found that two areas, plans of actions and milestones and identity access management, would be effective if implemented properly, although controls over access to FSA's mainframe environment need improvement. Although we did not make a separate conclusion on the effectiveness of the department's program to oversee contractor systems, our review found an issue involving an FSA subcontractor who restricted OIG access to information, which left my office unable to complete a comprehensive vulnerability assessment to determine whether the subcontractor's other customers improperly accessed department data. This is particularly problematic because, based on the information the subcontractor did provide to us, we found accounts with excessive permissions and unauthorized access. The results of our FISMA and other work show that the Department and FSA must work harder to address existing weaknesses so they can be in a better position to identify and stop increasingly sophisticated attacks on critical IT infrastructures. My office is committed to helping them do so. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Dr. Harris, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Shavitz, Representative Connolly and members of the committee, Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. As the Chief Information Officer for the Department of Education, I am committed to ensuring we have an effective cybersecurity program in place that includes strong controls. And continuously monitors, we continuously monitor and evaluate our posture for opportunities to minimize risk and exposure as we work to improve our current systems and processes. While Ed has made significant progress over the last several years in strengthening the overall cybersecurity program, we are not satisfied and we have solid plans to continue to increase the security of Ed systems. Before I dive into the specifics of our evolution, I wanted to provide brief organizational context that will assist our discussion today. Ed is organized under one department level CIL, a role that I have served in since 2008. The department level CIL manages all core IT functions, including, but not limited to, IT operations, cybersecurity, enterprise architecture, and IT investment management. The Federal Student Aid, a performance-based organization, also appoints a separate CIO, which reports to FSA's Chief Operating Officer. While the department-level CIO is ultimately accountable for the IT portfolio, FSA maintains independent operational responsibility for its IT portfolio. The FSA enterprise includes major mission systems that support student-facing and public services. A few examples include the commonly known Free Application for Federal Student Aid, or FAFSA, and StudentAid.gov. During my more than seven years as the department CIO, I've worked closely with leadership in FSA to ensure that IT management integrates with the department's IT systems. Since FY 2011, when the department was non-compliant with all 10 areas of FISMA, steady and consistent progress has been made. For example, the department established a continuing monitoring program to assess the security state
systems in the department's two distinct environments. One called Educate, which handles all of our infrastructure services, and the other, FSA's virtual data center. OCIO and FSA adopted and implemented automated scanning and detection tools to collect, analyze, and report on security-related risk, issues, and threats to the department systems. Other improvements include implementation of a network access control, or NAC, which provides device-level authentication and data loss prevention, or DLP, capabilities. This allows for control of data flowing in and out of our environment. Additionally, the OCIO moved from a managed service provider to an in-house security operations center, or what we call a SOC, which allows for real-time threat detection and tracking. As a result, it has gained better situational awareness of its network environment and is able to respond more rapidly to network events. In July 2015, a two-factor authentication solution for accessing email remotely from personally owned computers and mobile devices replaced the previous username and password authentication method. The new method meets strong authentication mandates defined by ONB. We have reduced our FISMA non-compliance from 10 metric areas to five and have solid plans of resolving the remaining deficiencies. Most recently, the department actively worked to address the focus areas of the cyber sprint by completing the review of identification of our high value assets, completing the indicators of compromised network scan, mitigating critical vulnerabilities, and reviewing and appropriately restricting privileged user access and FSA develop implementation plans to increase the issuance of personal identity verification or PIV cards to meet requirements of strong authentication. The OCIO completed its implementation this September and FSA's completion is scheduled for this December. OIG's objective for the 2015 FISMA audit changed from a compliance-based uh, auditing approach to a focus on general effectiveness of the department's IT security program and practices. OIG found that while the department has made progress in strengthening its information security program with five of the ten reporting metrics noted as generally effectiveness, effective, weaknesses were still noted in four of the five reporting metrics. Specifically, the IG determined it was not generally effective in the areas of continuous monitoring, configuration reporting, and remote access. In response, we are actively engaged in implementing solutions to address these areas. For example, to meet the requirements of OMB for implementing continuous monitoring by FY 2007, the department has developed an information security continuous monitoring implementation plan and is actively engaged with DHS to obtain continuous monitoring solutions as part of the task order two of the CDM program. Configuration management activities for FY 2016 include continuing the implementation of our NAC solution to restrict access for users and devices, strengthen the department's patch and vulnerability management program and prioritize and update policies and procedures to meet federal configuration management requirements. For incident response and reporting, the department is utilizing additional capabilities to identify and block attacks, for example, adding web application firewalls. And finally, to address weaknesses noted in remote access, the department continues to consolidate and standardize the remote access solutions currently in use. This will allow for increased consistency in the implementation of controls across the remaining solutions. FSA continues their implementation of two-factor authentication requirements to include two-factor enablement on their remote connections. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and provide you with specifics of our plans. I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. We will uh, now recognize uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the panel for being here. Uh, Mr. Harris, um, appreciate your testimony. Uh, and the information you've given. Um, as, as has been mentioned, DMCS supports uh, back-end loan collection uh, work for borrowers. As CIO, you rated DMCS as higher risk on the federal IT dashboard since at least September 12, 2013 due to contracting problems so severe a cure notice was even issued. Um, what do you consider when rating the risk of investments on the dashboard? Review that for us. Thank you for that question. Thank you for that question. Uh, there are a number of, of factors that I specifically look at as the CIO to rate an investment. A lot of it has to do with the project management of that investment. In other words, uh, are you uh, meeting deadlines on deliverables? Uh, a lot of it has to do simply with the size of the investment. Uh, more times than not, an investment can be uh, managed properly, but given the size of it, we still consider it high risk. 
In a lot of instances, we look at the kinds of data uh, that that system actually maintains. And so not in all instances will you see an investment that is doing well that still won't be perceived as a high risk. Based on that, uh, can you then explain why the risk rating went from yellow to dark red in May of 2014, a rating that changed shortly after the House Education and Workforce Committee held a hearing on the problems with the MCS, and, and why has the rating stayed red through May 2015? Uh, Representative Wahlberg, I don't have that information in my head right now, but that's certainly information I'd love to provide you. Be great if you could. Uh, any time frame that you could get that to us? Uh, certainly within a week, sir. Okay, appreciate that. Uh, on June 30th, 2015, DMCS was recategorized as low risk. Um, is your testimony uh, today here under oath that these contracting issues are fully addressed? Uh, again, Representative Wahlberg, I'd have to look at the details of that. And I will get that to you within the week as well. Okay, pretty significant details. Uh, we'd appreciate that, that information. Um, uh, Inspector General Teague, uh, are you confident uh, that all the problems are fixed and contracting with DMCS is okay based on your work? Based on our work, no, I can't say with confidence that everything in DMCS2 is fixed. I mean, the, the contractor, Maximus, who is currently operating DMCS2, had a number of, of problems it needed to fix um, when it, the contract began a year or so ago. Uh, I don't think we can say at this point. We have not audited um, specifically what Maximus has achieved, but I, I would find it hard to believe that all the fixes are, are complete. Have you looked at some of the objectives and parameters that they're using, and is there any confidence that flows from that? We have not audited the dashboard specifically and what goes into it and, and whether the analysis related to DMCS2 as put on the dashboard is correct or not. Uh, we've done a number of uh, uh, reports related to DMCS2 uh, dating back a few years. As, as you probably know, um, it was a material weakness in the financial statement a few years ago. Uh, it's gradually, um, they've tackled the problems and are able to make DMCS2 functional, at least with uh, workarounds, uh, but I, I, or manual workarounds, but I think that the, the new contractor is supposed to be working on making it fully functional. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Now I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley. For I thank the chair. Dr. Harris, I've got to say to you, it's not confidence building that you're asked questions by Mr. Wahlberg involving reports that, you know, going from ye yellow to red, now in a high-risk category, and your answer is, I've got to get back to you. Seemingly unaware of these reports, is that your testimony? You are not aware of these reports. This is news to you. No, Representative Connolly, it's not uh, news to me. Uh, there are, there's a large number of investments that I review. I want to make sure that I provide you accurate information. Well, it just seems to me if we're going to have a hearing on this subject and you're the CIO, one ought to be better prepared, frankly, coming before this committee to be able to answer questions that certainly you could have, should have anticipated. So in that same pleasant vein, can you, can you address the fact that you got the lowest grade possible in the Fatara scorecard? Understanding is a work in progress, and the intent here is not to put a scarlet letter on one's back, but, but you really got failing grades in all but one category, and that was a D. Um, I wouldn't have gotten into graduate school with that kind of scorecard. Uh, please address it. Absolutely, sir. Uh, I respectfully disagree with the rating. Uh, first of all, uh, I am not aware of the source of that information, but what I can tell you, sir, is that we have a solid plan in place, implementation plan in place for FATARA by this December, and quite frankly, in multiple meetings with ONB, they made it very clear to us that our plan was very solid. In fact, many of the uh, requirements of FATARA have already been satisfied by the department for many, many years. With the exception of FSA, currently all IT operations come through the uh, CIO, specifically spending, for example. And so I, I do disagree, respectfully disagree, 
and uh, I don't know, I haven't found the source of that information yet, but I think we're very solid on Fatara. Well, I, I not a confidence building measure to have the CIO saying he disagrees with the findings, and you think you're solid with Fatara when you got an F. What do you think you should have gotten? The highest grade was a B, and only two agencies got that. I actually think we should have gotten a C, sir, if I can give you an example of what sure. I mean. So take the first measure, for example, when you look at data center consolidation. The department currently, to be real honest with you, we don't own any data centers, but our contractors do, but that's beside the point. We still report. We have three data centers, three data centers, and in fact, we will be reducing that to two in FY16. And so it startles me that I see an F in data centers uh, when we actually are probably the smallest in the federal space. And given the amount of data processing we do, I think that's astounding. Uh, I will work with you on that because that happens to be one of my bugaboos. And the federal government, as you know, in our last hearing, to my surprise, we discovered 2,000 more data centers. So the fact that we have a federal agency testifying they only have three um, is music to our ears, and I will be glad to work with you, Dr. Harris, as I know this committee will, in trying to clarify that. Thank you. Um, if that's the case. But uh, uh, I, I, let me just say this. I exhort you to do what you can, not only in clarifying that grade, but more importantly, the spirit of this is improvement. Because the object here is to make sure that we don't have the kind of data breach we had at OPM. At the, at the Department of Education. And, and you have a sacred trust in protecting the data of 50 million Americans or more uh, in your care. And uh, you, know, you want to be making the headline that actually your, your data breach is twice that of you know, some other agency. And, and I mean, that's not your only goal. We want to see you be more efficient. We want you to see IT as a resource and a, a transformative process. Um, why are there, Dr. Harris, repeat recommendations coming out of OIG that haven't been acted on by your office or by the Secretary? Uh, I concur with uh, the IG as well as the committee that uh, repeat findings are always troublesome. There are two reasons why we uh, continue to have some repeat findings. Uh, the first reason is the resolution to some of the findings are quite complex and they require multiple years to actually resolve. An example. Uh, our implementation of our NAC and DLP. Uh, for the talent that we have, we've spent multiple years implementing NAC and DLP. And in fact, we will finish our implementation this year. But it has taken multiple years to implement those very complex systems. Um, and with the imp full implementation this fiscal year, we will actually resolve 90% of the repeat findings. And Ms. Ty, you're, you're, you would corroborate that? We would corroborate. I can't hear you. Um, yes, it has been, uh, we have observed that the NAC solution has taken a long time to, to fully implement, and it does impact some of our repeat findings. But you, but you agree with Dr. Harris's statement that by the, I think you said, the end of the year, about 90 percent of that will be addressed? I don't know if I can uh, agree with that. I mean, we haven't audited that conclusion specifically. We'll find out when we go in next year's FISMA audit. Okay. Thank you. My time is Will the gentleman yield? To, I, I want to help clarify this database center uh, issue. You have, uh, best I can tell, 184 information systems, correct? That's correct, sir. And you have 120 contractors that house that information, correct? That is correct, sir. So how many data centers do you have? We have three data centers that the Department of Education maintains. We have Federal Student Hate has... How many uh, data centers are there housing this information that you're responsible for? Uh, I don't know, Mr. Chairman. Well, there you go. There's the problem. The answer is not three. You're at least 123, and you don't know? Is a contractor not a database for you? I'm sorry. Ask the question again, sir. If a contractor is housing the information, is that not a database? We do not count that as a data center, sir. Why not? Uh, based on OMB's guidance on how we count data centers, we don't count that. It, we, we get that as a service. And so we don't count so it. So you just data. contract that out, you leave it alone. The inspector general can't look at it. You don't even consider one of your databases? We don't, sir. <laughs> so there's the problem. Mr. 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 Chairman, could I could I just sure, go ahead. I, 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 so your philosophy is that if data is compromised through a contractor, that's their problem, not your problem. That is not correct. Well, e you can't have it both ways. Either you take responsibility for a data center irrespective of where it's located, or you don't. 
It's under your charge. That's the point I think the chairman's making. You're paying for it. We're paying for it. Taxpayers are paying for it. I mean, fair it. enough you don't count it. This isn't a bureaucratic you know, checklist process. What we're concerned about is efficiency, reliability, and security. And if you've got hundreds or thousands of data centers under the care of contractors, okay, OMB may not count that as a technically a Department of Education data center, but it's still in your charge. And our concern here isn't to consolidate for the sake of consolidation so we feel better. It is because we believe it's inefficient to have a multiplicity of data centers. In fact, we know it is. And, and we need cooperation from every agency, irrespective of where they're located. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. And, and as a concluding point, I hope we could jointly ask that the GAO look at this this issue of data centers at the Department of Education. I would be happy to work with your staff to do that. Thank you. Now I recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Meadows, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I thank the, the ranking member for his insightful questions as it relates to these data centers. I have worked with him in a very close uh, way, in a bipartisan way. And so I find it just very interesting that your testimony here this morning would be that you have three data centers when the GAO would not do that. So you're disagreeing with the GAO on their definition. Is that correct? If GAO is suggesting that we have more, that the department has more than three data centers, yes, sir, I am disagreeing. Dr. Harris, uh, you know, the headline should read, Department of Education gets an F. Now. That's not good when we're talking about education. Uh, but what's even more troubling is the definition of a data center has been made very clear to me, and, and I'm, I'm not a CIO. Uh, GAO has been very clear on what they view a data center to be. And under your definition, under your definition, Everybody could get rid of every single data center by subcontracting out the service. Do you, do you follow the logic there? I do, sir. So are you suggesting that you'll go to zero and get an A on that dashboard just by subcontracting all your data centers out to someone else? No, sir, I do not. Okay, well then, then explain the disconnect to me. Why is your testimony three if indeed you're subcontracting out those services. So when ONB does a data call I, and they give us uh, guidance for how we report. I'm, I'm talking about GAO. I'm sorry. Uh, all right, the dashboard. They're, they're going to be the ones that help define this with Fatara and everything else, and we're going to have you back in here on a hearing. Uh, so with their definition, how do you think you can consolidate some of those data centers that are subcontracted right now? So do you have 120 subcontracted data centers? Sir, the only way to consolidate those is to actually consolidate contracts. Exactly. Thank you, Dr. Harris. And so are you going to consolidate contracts? We're certainly willing to take a look at that. Okay. Would I suggest that you do that? Because if not, you're going to continue to get an F when it comes to data consolidation. The risk is spread across 120 subcontractors. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. Okay, and Ms. T, were, were you able to infiltrate their system? Uh, I, I noticed the notes from the uh, FY 2015 indicated that you were able to penetrate the Educate system. Were you able to do that? Yes, during our penetration testing for our the FISMA audit this year, we were able to um, gain access, full access to the Educate system, which is the general support system that houses a number of the department systems uh, undetected by either the contractor for Educate uh, Dell or the CIO's office. So you're saying Dr. Harris didn't know that you were there? Correct. So Dr. Harris, how do, how do you explain, I mean, are you willing to stake your reputation and your job on the fact that the system is secure? I am today, sir. With so so if, if there is a breach from this point forward, you're willing to resign? No, it, sir, I did not say okay, that. Okay, well, you, I said your reputation and your job. I, I certainly will stake my reputation, given where we are today. 
our full implementation of NAC and DOP. So how example, confident on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the highest, are you that we will not have some kind of a breach? Ms. T was able to get in. I've got ha hackers I could probably hire to get in there today. Wouldn't you agree with that? As of today, sir, I would rank it a seven. A seven. So yes. when we're making great progress, but I would rank it a seven. Okay. Now, is this a seven on the same scale that you just gave yourself a C, uh, where Fatara gave you uh, the dashboard gave you an F? That is correct, sir. All right. So this is the grading according to Dr. Harris. I just believe we've made a tremendous amount of progress. Uh, okay. Uh, so what do we tell? the 125 million people that have their personal identification numbers potentially at risk when you say that it was a seven, you've staked your reputation on it, and yet we have a, a breach like we had at OPM. Are, are you confident that we're not going to have that? I have strong confidence, sir. May I tell you why? Even prior to the cyber sprint where two-factor authentication required level of assurance for. Long before that, we had two-factor authentication at uh, LOA 3. Not as strong as 4, but... But on two-factor authentication, you went down. Uh, it has already been testified. You went down. You went the opposite way on our 30-day uh, testing period on the two-person you know, two authentication. So you may have had it, but you weren't using it. Might I explain? Sure. Interestingly enough, two things happen during the cyber sprint. The definition of privileged users changed, and the LOA, the level of assurance, changed. Take a look at uh, the privileged users. The definition went from a technical, hardcore uh, access to technical information to anyone who had access to PII. As a result of that, we voluntarily changed our number to significantly increase the number of privileged users that we reporting, which dropped our percentage. All right. I, and I appreciate the Chair's indulgence. Thank you for your answer. I'll yield back. Thank the gentleman. We'll now recognize the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Maloney, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, there, there have been a number of significant data breaches over the past year that have jeopardized the personal and financial information of millions of Americans. Anthem, Primera Blue Cross, the Office of Personnel Management, and most recently, Experian, all suffered breaches in which hackers were able to steal the personal information of millions of individuals. Uh, Mr. Harris, we are not here today talking about that kind of massive data breach that has actually happened at the Department of Education, correct? That is correct. Okay. The Department of Education systems do contain large volumes of sensitive information, however, including personnel records, financial information on students and borrows that would be attractive to cyber thieves. Therefore, it's an important part of our oversight to ensure that these systems are adequately protected. Uh, Ms. Teague, according to the 2015 audit your office issued last Friday, and I quote, the department and FSA made progress in strengthening its information security systems, end quote. What are the areas where you what, what are the areas where you have seen the department make the most progress? Some of the areas include um, they've done a good job on password controls for system users. Uh, they've done a better job, a much better job of once incidents are, are found of reporting them up through you assert and, and addressing those issues. Um, and, and another area, because we noted in our FY14 report, our last year's FISMA report, that there were problems in CIO's office with the fact that they would say they've implemented corrective action, but we would go in the next year and continue to find the same problem, uh, even though they said that they did it. They've now implemented a much better process for dealing with corrective action, and so we've been very pleased to see them actually resolve some issues. Okay, and, and in your 2015 audit, you did identify several weaknesses in the department's information security system. With respect to those weaknesses, your report states, and I quote, we found that the department was not generally effective in four security areas, uh, continuous monitoring, configuration management, incident response and reporting, and remote access management. 
Uh, Ms. Mr. Harris, as the department's CIO, do you agree with the IG's assessment that the department needs improvement in the four security areas I just read? Yes, Representative Maloney, I do concur. Okay. Are, are there any areas in which you disagree with the IG's assessment about the departments of weaknesses in IT security? And if so, what are they? No, Representative Maloney, I do not. You do not. Okay. In addition to reporting on weaknesses the IG found in the department's IT security, the report makes 26 recommendations for improving the effectiveness of the information security programs. Uh, Mr. Harris, do you have a timeline for implementing the IG's recommendations? Our plan is to resolve all of those recommendations in FY16. And when will you have all the recommendations implemented, all of them by, by the end of 2016? That is correct. Okay. Do you, do you have all the tools you need to make the improvements the IG recommended? It is a very, very aggressive uh, a plan and strategy, but that is surely our intent. If we have to move resources from one place to another, it is certainly our intent to do so. Well, I, I want to thank you. Uh, given the large amounts of sensitive and confidential information the department retains, it is imperative that it move as quickly as possible to correct the weaknesses the IG has reported in her report. Okay, thank you. I think the gentlewoman will now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Walker, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Inspector General found that the Department's remote access management program was not generally effective because it did not enforce its network timeout requirement, or more significantly, use the two-factor authentication for two of its network connections. The failure of the Department to enforce the two-factor authentication requirement for remote access users opens it up to the same style of cyber attacks employed or that were used against OPM. Uh, Ms. Ty, let me start with you, if I could, please. Can you elaborate on how the Department's failure to enforce timeout requirements and the two-factor process for this remote access opens up the Department of Education to the same attacks, potentially, that we saw used against the OPM? Well, yeah, uh, the problem uh, that we identified this year, we had uh, gone out and asked for uh, the inventory, and this was to the Federal Student Aid Organization, what's your inventory of remote access uh, devices? Uh, they identified four. We did penetration testing, found two more that they didn't even know about, and those two did not have two-factor authentication. So they, they have now, we understand, uh, have, have put two-factor authentication on those two additional remote access points, but we still have, I believe, a couple of outstanding uh, recommendations related to remote access. And if you do not have proper controls, obviously, on, on remote access, then, then you do open up uh, the department to, to attacks from the outside. Sure, and, and I'm sure you guys are taking the precaution. You're looking at these two adjustments, modifications, or things that we can include to prevent maybe some more of the cyber attacks. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. Dr. Harris, what is the Department of Education? What are your actions in doing to solve this problem? You guys do anything specific to making sure, you know, if I remember correctly, the OPM uh, Director Archuleta ended up having to resign because the breach was so intensive. We don't want the same kind of thing here in the Department of Education. Can you tell me what action steps you guys are taking? Absolutely, Representative Walker. Uh, so for the two incidents you just mentioned, I concur with the IG. Uh, we have since resolved both of those. Uh, the incident, not passing the buck, uh, I don't have operational responsibility for, but at the end of the day, I am accountable and responsible for. And so we have made sure that we continue to harden our two-factor authentication. And what's really critical is we are looking at least privilege. It's not just a matter of managing your privileged users, but making sure they have the minimum privileges that they need. So we're doing both of those. Would you mind dialing it down just a little bit more specific when you say you're doing both of those? Is there, is there a specific date of implementation, or how exactly are you doing these things to make sure that it's safer? Yes. On the education side, we've already completed 100 percent two-factor authentication, LOA4, the strongest. And on the FSA side of the house, the, uh, their uh, completion date is December of this year. Okay. Well, thank you for your answers. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the rest of the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. We'll now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Heiss, for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank each of you for being here and testifying. I would like to begin, uh, Ms. Ty, with you. Uh, according to the 2015 audit, as has already been brought up a couple of times here this morning, there were six repeat findings and 10 repeat recommendations. Uh, that, of course, I think raises a red flag for a lot of people as to why these things are not being addressed. Uh, so from your perspective, what is the issue? Is it an inability? Are they unable to take care of these issues? Or is it an, a matter more of an unwillingness to do so? Well, I think there's a lot going on here. There's no one particular reason. I mean, some is, as Dr. Harris testified, the fact that sometimes solutions are, can't happen short term, that they are sometimes long term. Um, sometimes we raise issues uh, on particular systems and they may achieve a solution to that particular problem, but what they don't then do is say, hey, maybe we have the same problem on other systems. So we go back in the next year, because we kind of rotate through our work looking at different systems, because we can't look at 184 every year, right? So, and sometimes we get to the next year and we see the same problem we identified on this system and another system, which is what, you know, gets frustrating for us. So you would put the blame on the systems rather than an well, inability or an unwillingness to address Well, I think, I think there needs to be a couple of things. I think attention needs to be paid to our recommendations and priority given to them. Uh, I think uh, sometimes long-term solutions can seem to happen be longer than maybe they need to be. Uh, and also, I think that when we make a recommendation pertaining to one system, it would be good to step back and think for the department to step back and think, hey, is this same problem? problem happening on other systems. Okay, thank you. Dr. Harris, utilizing um, outdated technology, and I think you have acknowledged that as well. Um, in fact, it appears from, from what I've read, there's 962 operating systems that are no longer supported by vendors. I, that's inexcusable. The vulnerabilities are uh, can't even be spoken of. I mean, we can't even fathom the kind of vulnerabilities when you're utilizing technology that's not even supported any longer, and yet you said you feel you'd give yourself a 7 out of 10 that we're currently, how in the world can you give yourself a 7 out of 10 when we're using technology that's not even supported? Representative Heiss, I would concur with you that uh, it is ridiculous that we're using this old technology. The seven that I give us is the remediation that we have in place and the tools we have to actually protect those outdated systems while we work hard to catch up. So on the one hand, you're absolutely right. There are vulnerabilities on that side, but the remediation is on the side of the tools that we have in place as we modernize. Why is the department using that old technology? A, a lot Why is it, of it kept has... up with the times? Sorry, sir. A lot of it has to do with the system owners and the applications, uh, application owners' ability to keep up with the operating system. In some cases, you have to make a decision, do you shut down a mission-critical application that provides services to the public, or do you mitigate the risk? And more times than not, we mitigate the risk while we're trying to modernize. All right, so how long is it going to take to modernize? Uh, I don't have an answer to that, sir, across the entire platform, but I can tell you that we are working hard to do that modernization. All right, so we're going to continue to have vulnerabilities for an indefinite period of time. I think we will, sir, and I think what we have to do is work hard to make sure that we have tools in place that mitigates that risk. Okay, work hard sounds fine, Dr. Harris, but what does that mean? When, when can we expect the system to be secure? We have millions, tens of millions of people whose, whose lives and personal information is at a potential high risk as it relates to vulnerability, and your answer is we're going to work hard. What does it, when is the vulnerability be, uh, going to be removed? And Representative Heiss, I would say that we are reasonably secure now. I'm not suggesting that we're not secure, but we do need to strengthen. That's very important. I'm not going to suggest that we don't have a tremendous amount of work to do, but I want, don't want the general public to think that we are not secure. There again, reasonably is not a very secure answer. Uh, we've got a lot of people whose lives and personal information is potentially hanging in the balance, 
And uh, th this is an issue, Mr. Chairman, that hits every district in this country. Uh, and um, uh, my time has expired, but I, I thank, thank the Chairman for this, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. We will now recognize the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Kelly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Tai, your office identified key weaknesses in the ability of the Department and its contractor, Dell, to detect and prevent unauthorized access. Ms. Tai, I'm sorry. Can you tell us what your testers were able to do during the vulnerability assessment testing of some of the Department's IT environments? Yeah, we were able to, um, during the penetration testing, we were able to gain access or full access to the complete educate environment and edu have to understand as a sort of a joint systems. Uh, so we were able to completely access that and, un and went undetected by either uh, the department's contractor or the department. Thank you. The FISMA audit report explains that the department's defenses did not detect or terminate the unauthorized access and remained on the network for hours. What kind of risk are the department systems exposed to by these weaknesses in detection and prevention of unauthorized access? Well, I think the risk would certainly be um, access to the department's data. Uh, we, we could have really done anything in there. So the fact that we were able to gain access means that, that um, outsiders who have bad intentions are able also to come back through the, uh, the same way we did <laughs> and, and gain access. And, and that really puts the department systems and data and, and employees and everybody who um, uh, deals with, uh, is involved in our systems at risk. Mr. Wilshusen, do you know whether this kind of undetected, unauthorized access is characteristic of some of the major data breaches that have occurred in the public and private sectors? Yes, I think it is actually. Uh, indeed, just for example, like with the OPM breach, that occurred for a number of months before it was actually detected. And so I think that's often one of the hallmarks of these very successful attacks is that they do go undetected. They exploit known vulnerabilities in systems and then uh, go undetected. Okay. The OIG recommended that the Department ensures its intrusion detection and prevention system and technical security architecture are properly configured to restrict and eliminate unauthorized access. Mr. Harris, the Department concurs with this recommendation, Ab correct? Yes, we do. What is the status of the Department's planned corrective actions and when do you expect them to be completed? So I am pleased to announce that with the implementation of our um, a NAC system, it allows us to do three things. It allows us to look at all, look and touch all of our assets. It allows us to see the configuration on those assets and allows us to manage the vulnerability on those assets. FY16, we plan for a full implementation. It is in place now, and we can monitor. The full implementation will allow us to actually block um, anomalous behavior. Is this FY16 January or March, when, around when in FY16? Uh, the, the third quarter is what we are looking at. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Tai, you said in your testimony that the Department was effective in ensuring proper incident response and reporting once incidents were reported. Can you describe what steps in the Department has taken to ensure it's effectively respond to incidents? Yeah, they have, um, and I would defer to <laughs> Dr. Harris on this if he has more to add, but I know that they have a, a, a SOC, a security operations center, up and running, and that's given them capabilities they never had before in terms of, of uh, incident um, reporting and response. Dr. Harris, did you want to add? Yes, I would. Uh, we have an uh, incident response uh, process that follows both OMB and NIST guidelines, and we also have a very strong and well-documented PERT process, uh, basically a privacy incident response team that goes into action when we have breaches. Okay. And you discussed in your testimony the role of the Department of Homeland Security has in helping the Department identify risks. Can you expand upon that? How do those programs help supplement your efforts? Uh, sure. I, I talk about and, and very, it, it, I'm very enthusiastic about the progress that the Department has made over the last three years. A lot of it has to do with the shared services that DHS provides to us, specifically with uh, CDM uh, Task Order 2, where we will expand our sensors, uh, we will also lower the cost of licensing, and more than anything else, we will have access to dashboards that actually 
uh, allow us in real time to look at vulnerabilities. That's what we're missing right now. Okay, well, thank you, and I look forward to seeing further progress from all agencies in detecting and responding to incidents. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentlewoman. We'll now recognize the chairman of the subcommittee on IT for our Oversight and Government Reform Committee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start off with a simple question. This is to you, Ms. Tai. Um, when you conduct your penetration testing or technical vulnerability assessment, who decides when that happens? Can the department come and say, listen, this is a tool we would like to use. Can you do this? Or is this something that you do independently? We do it independently. And is that the same across most agencies? I think that's the same with most IGs who do penetration testing. I'm not sure everybody does. And how often do you plan on doing penetration testing? We do it every year as part of our FISMA audit. Okay. Because that's, that's, a, that's an industry best practice. It's a good thing that this is going on, and the information you glean is important uh, for Dr. Harris and his team. Dr. Harris, the remaining of my questions are for you, and I'm going to read your statements. And I usually like to dig into the weeds at these hearings, but um, th there's, there's a lot of uh, big rock um, sh strategic issues that, that have come out here today. Um, in your testimony, you say the department level CIO, that's you, manages all core IT functions, including but not limited to IT operations, cybersecurity, enterprise architecture, and IT investment management. And you further add that the Office of Federal Student Aid, FSA, appoints a separate CIO. Now, you're saying that you're responsible for all IT department activity, but you don't have control over all the activities within the Department of Education. Would that be a true statement? That is correct, Representative Herb. Does that make sense? Uh, I believe that Fataro will strengthen my ability and authority to actually provide more guidance and oversight, and if you want to use the word control over operations. Right now, that is a challenge. So one, there's two people missing here today, to be frank. Number one is the agency head. Right? And I know um, Arnie Duncan has announced his retirement and John King over as acting duties, and I think uh, through the, the rest of this administration, because ultimately the buck stops there. Um, but we're also missing the CIO of FSA um, participating in this conversation because it doesn't make any sense. And we go back to the, the um, issue of um, uh, data centers. D Department of Education is ultimately responsible for all the data centers that hold information for these kids that are applying for federal aid. So saying that we have three is being disingenuous, right? And, and the, my question is, you know, when you, we have these issues, who's remedi remediating these vulnerabilities, especially when it comes to FSA? Are you responsible for it? Is the CIO of FSA responsible for it? Who's ultimately supposed to be held accountable for these issues? And you talk about NACS implementation, is this going to include all the subcontractors, or is this just Department of Education employees that have that on their badge, not necessarily all the subcontractors that work for you? Currently, it's just the Department of Education, the latter. Does that make sense? No, sir, it does not. So, IG report showed that since 2011, there was no mechanism to restrict the use of unauthorized devices on the network. Having the ability to find devices on your network, does it really take four years to figure that out? With the talent we had, sir, it took us that long. And so in the last three years, we've made a tremendous amount of progress. Well, that's not very encouraging. Um, I'm, I'm hoping we have increased uh, the talent um, in, in order to do that. Because, Ms. Ty, would you have any opinions on how long it would take to implement one of these systems? Well, I would hope. It would be done sooner, but well, I, 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 know and, but I, I would point out that, that this year's report also highlighted this again as an issue, so to the extent that... Great. So, uh, Mr. Harris, how many users do you have in the Department of Education? Approximately 6,000, sir. Okay. And how many, uh, does that include subcontractors? That is correct, sir. So 6,000, just 6,000. Yes, sir. 6,000 is not a lot. Right? And, um, and I would hope you would share with your, your CIOs and agency heads. Generally, when I ask questions at these hearings, I know the answer um, because I used to do this for a living. Right? And to have to implement 
controls on 6,000 users should not take four years. I literally thought you were going to say 60,000 or 600,000 users, right? This is completely unacceptable. So who, who, who are some of the vendors? So you have a, there's 120 contractors. Is, is that right, Chairman? Or do you know the answer? How many other subcontractors do you have? Now, the 6,000 includes just the individuals using the department's data centers. It does not include the users for the subcontracts outside of the, the uh, VDC. And so the so why, are, why, are these, why, are these, why are these subcontractors not under your purview and your responsibility and your operational control? Uh, because for the most part, FSA has contractual arrangements with them. They don't operate their data. So centers. why does FSA not? Ha so does Arnie Duncan have control over FSA? Does Arnie Duncan tell FSA do this and FSA does that? Uh, I can't answer that, sir. I'd like to get back. So to the that CIO question. of FSA, do, can you tell that person what to do? I cannot, sir. That person reports to the uh, COO of FSA. I and who provide this, direction. And do you know who the COO of FSA re reports to? Uh, yes, the secretary. Interesting. Um, I don't even know where to continue. I see my, my time has expired. But this is the kind of issue that the American people are completely frustrated with. This is, you know, this is not a bureaucratic exercise, as my friend from Virginia pointed out. And saying that Department of Education has a certain level, but you're responsible for all these others. And if you don't have the authority or the power um, to do that, then you know what? We're, we're here to, to give you that authority because we want to hold you accountable, and, but we want to make sure you have all the tools at, at, at your disposal to do these things. But it's unacceptable to say 6,000 people I could probably do that over the weekend. It, this, is, this is completely unacceptable. And I look forward to the hearings tomorrow. I saw, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, for over, um, going over my time. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize myself. Uh, to the gentleman from Texas, I'd tell you that I believe we have, uh, just in the National Student Loan Database, 97,000 accounts. 97,000, a little higher than the, the 6,000. I think you have struck the heart of what is the problem because uh, one of the problems, under the E-Government Act of 2002 and certainly under FATARA, you are supposed to not only have the responsibility but the authority. And I think the gentleman is right. Secretary Duncan needs to answer this. And my question, how often do you meet with Secretary Duncan? Uh, on a monthly basis, sir. And so, I meet with the Deputy Secretary weekly. So to the gentleman from Texas, I would suggest um, here they're managing more than a trillion dollars in assets, liability for the United States. It's basically the size of Citibank, and the CIO meets with the Secretary maybe 12 times a year, right? Once a month? That is correct, sir. I mean, that's absolutely stunning. And looking at the vulnerability of almost half of the population of the United States of America has their personal information sitting in this database, which is not secure. By any standard, any scorecard, it's not secure. Trillion dollars, half of all America, and the Secretary of Education, eh, once a month. How long do you meet with him? For when you have, when's the last meeting you had with him? About three weeks ago, sir. How long did you meet with him? For an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, is it a budget problem? What is your budget? How much money do you have? We spend approximately $550 million a year, and about $32 million of that is for IT security. How much is for IT security? $32 uh, million. However, there is a large percentage of embedded cost for our contractors that would significantly increase that number. That and we will have to work this out with you. My understanding is you spend $683 million on uh, IT at the Department of Education. but. Do you need more money, or do you have enough money? Certainly, we could always use more. Everybody always <laughs> says that. Sir. Everybody always says that, okay? Certainly. So, but I would say, sir, For that God's sake, say yes, Dr. Talent. Harris. <laughs> I would say that my biggest challenge is cybersecurity talent, even more than money. If you told me to take a choice between the first or the second, I would say you can give me all the money in the world, but if the federal space can't obtain and retain the cyber talent, we are in big trouble. No, I, 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 would, I absolutely agree with you, and it is something I think this committee looks, needs to look at. 
is uh, uh, the pay authority to perhaps even pay the IT specialists more in such a critical, vulnerable situation and the ability in the marketplace to actually attract and retain people. I would agree with you. Does the Department implement the Department of Homeland Security continuous diagnostic and mitigation system? And, uh, and do you have the Einstein intrusion detection program thoroughly and completely integrated into all of your IT systems? We do, sir. In fact, the Department of Education was one of the first to implement Einstein 1, Einstein 2. We are now working with DHS to implement Einstein 3. And yes, we do participate in CDM Task Order 2 specifically. Does that include the subcontractors and co contractors and subcontractors? It or includes those that run our data center. But it doesn't include some of the partners that FSA has. Okay, so who doesn't it include? It, it doesn't include, again, some so, of the 100. So if you have 120 contractors. It doesn't include some of them. I would have to get you specific information on, okay, If you can follow up with us and sir. the IG and GAO, that would be, that would be uh, great. Um, Mr. Harris, have you had an intrusion? I'm sorry, sir, say that again. Have you had an intrusion? Have you had a data breach? We have had uh, both incidents and data breaches. Specifically, in 2015, we had 91 uh, breaches and we had 200, uh, about 250 incidents. We have not, in the history of the department, to my knowledge, we have not had a major incident. And so all of them fall into the minor category. And if I might give you an example of one. What, what was the most significant one? I would say, sir, that the most significant one uh, was in 2012 when in the FAFSA system for a matter of minutes, as a result of a, an application glitch, users were able to see other users' PII. And again, it was several minutes, but that's pretty critical. Did you report that to the Inspector General? Uh, I'm sure we did, sir. Um, in the past year, are you aware of any foreign national state or other adversary penetrating the network? Did any of those data breaches and incidents happen in the last year? Not in the last year, sir, though we constantly are threatened by them, but no breaches to my knowledge. Not in the last year. That is correct, sir. Um, how many on-site IT security reviews uh, has the department conducted to date of the contractors that you engage with? Uh, our reviews of our contractor are actually constant. We have a security operations center uh, and we have an IVNV contractor that are working daily to review uh, everything that our uh, contractor is doing. Ms. Tai, what's your view of that? Sorry, microphone. I'm aware that the department is taking those actions. Um, some parts, I would also point out that some parts of the department and systems the department deals with um, have uh, and its external business par partners like the Title IV servicers do get IT general controls reviews every year um, because they feed into the financial statement audits. Uh, so we do have some level of assurance outside of the department that that some uh, that there is some IT reviews being done of the department systems. All right, last question is before I recognize uh, Mr. Palmer here. Um, departmental policy requires that all employees and contractors who have access to Privacy Act data have a minimum of a 5C public trust background check. But it's also my understanding that roughly less than 5,000 of the people who have access have actually had such a background check, which leaves us in, in the math roughly 85,000 individuals who have had no background check have access to personal information in your databases. Would you disagree with any of those numbers? And what are you doing about it? I would not disagree with that information, sir. So if it's departmental policy to have background checks for people who have, remember, we're talking about mostly. This, these are student loans, right? We're talking about students and kids here. So when you're talking about access to private information 
and it's departmental policy to have a background check, and yet 85,000 of them don't have a background check, what are you doing to solve that? Uh, sir, I don't believe that includes the individuals who have access to their own information. So the 85,000 you mentioned aren't system uh, operators who are actually looking at PII. For example, if uh, we have a student looking at their own information, they do not need a 5C. Well, no, that, that number is in the tens of millions of people, if not hundreds of millions of people. So that, if they're looking at their own information, I'm not counting that. I'm talking about people who have access into the system to go look and fish around. And Ms. Ty, can you ask, provide more information about that? Well, I believe that there are, uh, with access to the National Student Loan Database, just taking that database, that there are, our numbers are that there are about 97,000 accounts. This is not, these are non-student accounts. 55,000 of those, we should all realize, are at institutions of higher education because all the financial aid officers in every college and university or other school that receives Title IV funding has to access our databases. And I think that is the, the biggest area where you're not seeing the background investigations unless that particular college or university requires it themselves. Uh, but there are other people who access, who have accounts. They're the Title IV servicers, the debt collection entities. There's 22 of those, uh, and other other sort of people who touch our systems. And we know how integrity filled the debt collection services people are. So you know, no no need for a background check there. Um, that is departmental policy. I need you to get back to us as to what you're doing to rectify that. It is, I think, a huge vulnerability because these are people that are authorized. They have the authentication to get in there, look around, see the personal identif identifiable information, and yet have not had the required background check. I will do that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I've gone well past my time. We'll recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to follow up on the question the chairman raised, uh, Dr. Harris, about uh, Einstein, during the IG penetration testing of Educate, why didn't you detect they were on your servers? Uh, currently, as I indicated, we have implemented NAC. The full implementation, however, is not complete, and we plan to complete that this fiscal year. So you're um, saying, and I do believe we will be able to see that activity then. Now, I'm asking why you didn't detect it when they were on your servers at the time they were doing the penetration testing. We didn't have the tools completely configured. Okay. What tools are you missing? Uh, we're not missing any. We just don't have them completely configured. For example, NAC has been implemented, but there's a lot of configure work, configuration work that needs to be done for full implementation. So you have the tools, but you, you're not able to apply them. We haven't finished the we haven't completed the configuration of it, but I'll, we plan to do that this fiscal year. You you should have it done by the end of this fiscal year or the calendar year. By the fiscal year, sir. So they'll be complete by September 30th of 16. Uh, sir, I'm hoping to uh, complete them by the end of the third quarter, not September 30. Okay, so and we're aggressively working to actually do it sooner than then. All right, they'll be finished by the end of June. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Dr. Harris, according to the Federal IT Dashboard, DOED Central Processing System carries out data matching with at least five different agencies and interfaces with DOED's Participation Management Common Origination System and Virtual Data uh, Center. What is the nature of this understanding between agencies? Beyond the sharing of, of data, that really is uh, the the totality of that, of that understanding. We share sensitive data, we share important data with which to do better data processing on both sides. Well, CPS is not PIV enabled and if it were to be breached, an adversary would have access to sensitive, personally identifiable information and data that multiple agencies rely on. Can you tell me what security measures are in place to protect the CPS system? Uh, I apologize, sir. I don't have operational oversight of that system and have limited knowledge, but I can certainly get you more information on that. Who has that information? Uh, this, the Federal Student Aid CIO. Okay. One last question. Uh, do you allow employees to use your server to access their personal email? Or Currently we do, sir. Is that not uh, of concern to you? It, I, it, I'm sorry, sir. Well, 
um, we've had other hearings on this when we were dealing with the breach at OPM, and it turns out that uh, the immigration uh, ICE had sent out a memo to their employees that they could no longer use the uh, federal server uh, because they had uh, multiple breaches, and it appears, uh, and it turns out that uh, uh, there was a union grievance filed and they weren't able to um, deny their employees access to their server, and, and it appears that that's where one of the breaches occurred. I just wonder, uh, with the, as the chairman points out, the enormous number of records that, that could be accessed if you're taking any measures to prevent that. It's an interesting question, Representative Palmer, and it's one that does concern me. Uh, we actually met with uh, OMB and DHS to talk about the risk level of, of allowing that kind of access. I, I think the CIO Council is going to spend more time talking about it, but it is something that concerns me, and you're right, it is a threat vector. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. We'll now recognize Mr. Clay of Missouri for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Mr. Wilshues in the, uh, the high-risk report of um, GAO released earlier this year noted challenges that both the federal and private sector face when it comes to securing personally identifiable information. In particular, the 2015 high-risk report pointed to the data breaches at Home Depot and Target as examples of high profile. So it's fair to say that when, so is it fair to say when it comes to the subject of cybersecurity, GAO has paid attention to what's been occurring in the private sector? Uh, yes, it is, insofar as the, these types of incidents occur and demonstrate that it isn't strictly, or cybersecurity and these intrusions is not strictly a government uh, phenomenon. Now, I, I understand that when GAO conducted its most recent FISMA report on federal agencies, it wasn't tasked with evaluating the private sector. Uh, I would like to ask you some questions about challenges facing the, the private sector based on your prior work. Are the uh, weaknesses in cybersecurity you are aware of in the private sector consistent with what GA, GAO found with respect to federal agencies? Our review of information security controls at private sector organizations is somewhat limited, primarily to the work that we do in evaluating the security controls over contractors that support the federal government. And what we have found is that those contractors also have security vulnerabilities that are consistent with those that we find on agency-operated systems. So do you think the uh, federal government is ahead of the private sector when it comes to cybersecurity? I don't know if I could say that. One thing that I could say is that uh, at least the federal government, and particularly uh, in, in respect to the types of information security policies and guidance that are promulgated by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology is uh, among the best and, and are sometimes used by private sector organizations. Okay. So we do a pretty good job in identifying policies and procedures uh, where we're challenged is implementing them in our information systems controls environments over time throughout the entire enterprise. Ms. Tigg, would you have anything to add? No, I would agree that NIST provides very significant and complete guidelines for IT in the area of IT security, the challenges getting them implemented. Thank you. And Dr. Harris, anything? Uh, I would absolutely concur. In fact, as we work with some of our private sector partners, we see that uh, they don't use standards as stringent as those that NIST provides. Thank you. All. Thank all of you for your response. May I yield the balance of my time to the ranking member? I thank my colleague. Uh, by the way, uh, I'll throw you a lifeline, Dr. Harris. We've talked a lot about FSA, but it was Congress acting on recommendations of a previous administration that actually made FSA a PBO, a performance-based organization, and even referred to it as uh, FSA is generally siloed from the rest of the Department of Education, although its chief Operating Officer reports to the Secretary of Education, as Dr. Harris testified. So uh, it's Congress in legislation 
uh, that we passed in 1997 on a bipartisan basis, our colleague, uh, former colleagues Howard Buck McKeon and Dan Kildee, who actually authored H.R. 2536 that did that. So uh, we now need, because of the passage of Fatara, frankly, to square those two. And I think the current Congress would favor the Fatara approach and maybe look a little askance at siloing anything in light of technology progressing and the threat we're facing. Um, if, the, if, the, if, if the Chair would just indulge me one question and then I'm done, sure. if, if yeah. Mr. Mulvaney would. Um, okay. In listening to this hearing, I'm not sure we're reassured. Uh, we dispute the F we get in Fatara. We're not fully aware of these other rankings that move us to high risk or yellow to red. Um, systems weren't quite in place when the penetration exercise, according to Ms. Tai, we could have gone anywhere, unquote, uh, in that exercise. Very alarming. We only had three data centers. But we don't know how many our contractors have, and we're not really entirely responsible for that, even though they're in possession of data that could be compromised. Um, uh, certainly take the point, Dr. Harris, that we need to uh, bulk up on, on the talent pool as much as we do resources. But it's, it, we need both. We need both. There's no question about it. Um, but at the end of the day, Dr. Harris testified with respect to the question of vulnerability, quote, we are reasonably secure now. I don't want anyone to think otherwise. I, I, I got to challenge that, and I want you, Ms. Tai, and you, Mr. Wilshelson, to respond to that. My question is, should Americans be concerned that the kind of breach that occurred at OPM, frankly, could occur with respect to at least 50 million Americans whose data is in the hands of the Department of Education? I'm not leaving this hearing feeling that we're reasonably secure now. Professionally, is that your judgment? Do you share Dr. Harris's confidence that we are reasonably secure now? I, I am still concerned um, about the potential for, for breaches in the department. I think that the issues we pointed to in our current FISMA report, particularly under the areas of configuration management, and under incident detection are very significant. And, and, and they really point to the potential for, for significant vulnerabilities. There was also the issue on the, the mainframe in Georgia operated by a subcontractor that we were not even able to properly evaluate. And we found privileged users with, with permissions not appropriate. Uh, that stuff worries me, uh, and, I, and I, I, I don't feel, you know, as rosy about the picture as Dr. Harris. With all that said, I, I know the department is working on these things. Uh, I would defer to uh, Ms. Tai in her assessment, uh, but also just comment on the types of weaknesses that she and her team identified at education as being those types of vulnerabilities that can be exploited and can be used to gain access and even, you know, potentially hide an intruder's uh, presence on a network. I thank the Chair and I thank Mr. Mulvaney for his courtesy. We will now recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Mulvaney. Thank both the gentlemen. And I have just got a couple of mopping up um, questions here at the end, so in no particular order. Um, Mr. Harris, you mentioned a couple different times um, talent which is something we don't hear much in here. Ordinarily, people come in and complain they don't have enough money. Um, I've not heard that one before. Let me ask you this. Do you not have access? My understanding was that in other areas of the federal government, we have some really, really good people working on IT. Do you not have access to their expertise and their subcontractors and their, their, their experiences? Thank you so much for the question, Representative Mulvaney. Uh, I'm so glad you raised it because you do have talent across the federal space. And in fact, one of the things I am hoping that this body will help with is actually centralizing some of that talent so a small agency like the Department of Education can get more help. But what the, federal, what the private space is paying 
Uh, we simply can't match that. And in a lot of instances, folks don't see the Department of Education as an exciting cyberspace to go to. So we're very challenged when we compete with other federal agencies as well as the private space. So we are really hurting from that perspective. And that's what sort of what worries me is that because you're not exciting, people actually might be attracted to you um, in terms of being a target. Ms. Ty, come back to something you said earlier about, and I'm going to butcher the numbers, 97 odd thousand users, and you made an excellent point, which is that there's someone in the, in the, in the registrar's office at GW who has access to this system. Let me ask you this. If I'm sitting there and I'm at GW and I'm the, you know, the little part-time student who comes in to work on the FISA stuff, what do I need in order to get Mr. Chaffetz's um, student loan information? Well, you need his, most financial aid administrators, well, you probably need him to either have gone to GW University okay. or, or put that as one of his schools on his application. Okay, so well, they, I, have a, they have a more limited purview that they have access to. All right, so if I'm sitting there, I, I'm the person at GW who's, and I hate to pick on GW, but I went or to his Georgetown. Social. Yeah, I, I'd love, I went to Georgetown, so I'd love to pick on GW. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that uh, I can only, you're telling me I can only gain access to people who've actually either gone to GW or checked that on one of their Pfizer. Yes, programs. unless they, for whatever reason, would have their social security number. And that was my next question, yeah. which is if I have Mr. Chaffetz's social security number and he's in the system, I can get him, can't I? That's my understanding. So that means that if I'm able to acquire that social security number from any other source and I have access to your system at thousands, tens of thousands of terminals, I can get just about anything. That's correct. Now let me, let me drill down on that a little bit. What is just about anything? Because when I, what, I got a little notice from, from, I think it was Target, my wife did, saying that they had been hacked, I get all that, that's right. That doesn't bother me too much. I think we use the same credit card there and I don't use anything else at Target. Um, on a, uh, if you hack into Mr. Chaffetz's records uh, at the Department of Education, what type of information can you get on him? Well, you can obviously, you can get um, the financial information reported in the, in the application for federal student aid. Um, does and that include his parents' income? Yes, it does. Does it include any bank account information? We didn't have these no. forms when I was in school, Do so I'm not really sure. Bank account information? Yeah, is, I think, believe there is banking information. What about um, stocks and bond account information? I wouldn't think that would be available. Okay, all right. What else can you get, just out of curiosity? Let me get back to you on a full okay. accounting of what that is available. And, and maybe, I hope I'm making my point, which is yeah. that when Target got hacked, it, yeah. I, I didn't lose a lot of, of, of concern over it. If someone had my bank account records, that might, including, I guess, account numbers, because I guess you all at some point verify that information or can. Well, there is um, information related to the students for disbursements of student aid, you know, moving money into the, the students' bank accounts. So. Sure. Um, Okay, um, and I'm sorry, I lost track of where I was going after that, so I'd be happy to yield to the chair whatever 40 seconds I have left, but I thank you all for your information if, and if, look forward to going forward. If the gentleman will yield, there are lifetime loan limits, right? So talk to the scope of time here that we're talking about. My understanding is in the National Student Loan Database is that once you get money, your your information is kept in there for, you know, like, I don't think there is a, a deadline or cutoff for when that information gets moved, because there are uh, statutory limits on the amount of student aid one can take, so they have to keep track of it over a lifetime. So they, it's, the, the information is retained for a very long time. And how many people in that database? There are... I think currently about 85, at least somewhere over 75 uh, million student accounts or student account information. And in addition to that, there are other individuals, right? So how many individuals are we ultimately talking about? Well, student loan database, the National Student Loan Database will have uh, just students who get financial aid. There are other systems the department has, like the, the CPS system, where you will have the parent information also. So how many Americans, what's the grand total of number of Social Security numbers? I, we, we had understood. Well, the, the 130, we, by our count from the OIG's estimation of looking at the department's databases, we have a, over 139 million unique Social Security numbers. And that's just in the, the student loan application and the PIN registry systems. 
Does the gentleman yield back? Yes, sir. Um, in, in wrap up here, I, I want to address something just to clarify. You have responsibility, Ms. Tai, is the Inspector General, to be able to go in and look at the contractors and the subcontractors, but you've had difficulty gaining access to some of those systems. You, specifically the COD or the Common or uh, Origination and Disbursement System, have you been able to look at that system? No, we were not able to. We um, included the mainframes of the department as part of our testing this year. Um, two of those mainframes are at the virtual, the VDC, the virtual data center. One of them is in Columbus, Georgia, and operated by a company called TSIS under a subcontract with the Federal Student Aid Organization. Uh, we um, entered into an agreement with them that outlined everything we needed. We gave them a timetable. Uh, they did not by any stretch of the managing agent uh, uh, meet that timetable, and in the end, they were not able to provide us very critical information for us to do a full vulnerability testing. They limited our information in the end to the education environment. The problem is that mainframe in Georgia is a shared environment with their private customers. And I understand the reluctance, but the fact remains is given the problems we found with what just what they were able to provide us, seeing privileged users that had excessive permissions and the like, uh, I worry about what other users we were not able to see have access to in our data. Well, we want to be supportive of the Inspector General community and the good people at TSIS, is that their name? They're about to get a nasty gram from the United States Congress and we will use every power we have to yank them up here and get make sure that you get the access to that information. So, I appreciate it. Uh, the folks down there can look forward to that. Um, we're going to make sure you have the access you need. Um, Mr. Harris, la la last bit of question. T talk to me about how dilapidated, outdated, some of the operating system software that you're having to deal with. Do you use a COBOL, for instance? Uh, no, sir, we do not use COBOL. Do you uh, on the FSA side, I'm not sure if they still have any COBOL-based systems, but I can get that information for you. But all the other systems, you're not aware of do any Do not COBOL? use COBOL, sir, no. Do you use DOS? Or what, 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 no, sir. What, what, uh, we're, we're primarily a Windows base. We use a lot of Linux, Unix. However, it's not just the uh, the operating system, it's the version. When you sure. get past N minus one and the vendor is no longer patching it, you have a problem. So how old is the, what's, what Windows operating systems are you using? Uh, and it's probably a whole gamut, it's, right? It's a, it's a, it's how a old gamut. is the worst, I mean, if you were to um, walk around and say, oh my goodness. It's probably the worst would probably be five versions old. So like, a, what is that, Windows 95, 97? Uh, probably 97. 97 still? And they're not even, they're not even servicing that at Microsoft anymore. That is correct. That is correct. So there's no security patches being updated? The not, for, not for those, sir, but to be, to be fair, uh, many of the systems using those operating systems do not have sensitive data. Uh, I, I don't want to suggest that there is student information sitting on systems that use Windows 97. Understood. But these are but OSs. But you feel for the employee who's their good, patriotic, hard-working employee who's going into work trying to negotiate a, a Windows 97 operating system as opposed to something a little bit more up-to-date. Um, listen, this has been very productive. Uh, I appreciate all the work that not only the three of you individually do, but that your organizations do. We've got a lot of good people who are trying to do the right thing. They work hard, and I want to carry back that um, how much uh, we care and appreciate them and what they do, uh, from the GAO to the Inspector General to the Department of Education. Um, that's the beauty, and I say this often in this committee, uh, the beauty of the United States of America is that the Congress does ask hard questions. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what makes us unique in this country is we hold people accountable, we ask hard questions, and, and we have the good dialogue uh, back and forth. So I appreciate the, I appreciate the attitude and approach, Mr. Harris, that you've had here. Um, but we do ultimately want to not only be the Oversight Committee, but uh, the Government Reform Committee. To the extent that we can help you uh, with these issues, we want to do that. 
And, and Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, happy to yield. We do have, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We do have a legislative item that sooner or later we're going to have to review, and that is this apparent conflict between what Fatar is trying to get at, which is to enhance Dr. Harris's authority and responsibility, and the older legislation from 1997 that may have been appropriate when Windows 97 was still operating. Uh, but, but we also need to up, upgrade our, our own legislative mandate because Dr. Harris is handicapped by statute. Uh, and we may have to address that. Point. And that is where I think the E-Government Act of 2002 is actually what we should be looking at. But I look forward to working with you because yep. you should have not only the responsibility, but the there should be no uh, discrepancy there. And we will work with you on that. Again, appreciate the participation of all the members. The committee stands adjourned.